Hello and welcome to your next session of Dementia Awareness course where we're looking at person-centred support. Um, so we're going to be looking at the person-centred approach to the care and support of individuals with dementia. So you did already look at person-centred support as part of your health and social care programme that you did with us or perhaps if you did that elsewhere you'll have, you'll have looked at person-centred care already as we have done all the way through your dementia course. This is just going to help you to understand the importance of that person-centred care. So your aims and objectives are to know what is meant by person-centred care, to understand the benefits of person-centred care and how to provide that care, and to understand the role of carers in the support and care of individuals with dementia. As always, please keep an eye out on the box on the right hand side that is green to help you to see which question the slide is relating to. So some key values in health and social care. Treating people as individuals so that we're not treating people the same. Supporting people to access their rights, things like human rights the rights to make choices and a right to have a say in their care. Supporting people to make those choices, whether that is a choice in everyday life, uh, such as what to eat, what to drink, or whether that is a choice about their type of care that would be in their care plan. Making sure they have privacy if they would like it, because sometimes we like to be alone and that's okay. Supporting people to be as independent as possible. So allowing people to take care of themselves for as much as they can do for themselves, the more independent they will be. Treating people with dignity and respect. So not looking at the differences that people have. Recognising that working with people is a partnership rather than a relationship that's controlled by the professional. So you, as a carer, should be working together with the service user. So you shouldn't be viewing them as inferior. You shouldn't be looking down on them. You are employed to support them, to respect them, and to value their opinions and choices, because that is what true caring is. Person-centred care. So what is this? It's allowing people to feel safe and secure physically and emotionally. It's about enabling people to achieve their goals and aspirations, no matter what gets in the way. It's involving their family, their friends and their informal carers. It's about taking account of their needs and wishes and likes and dislikes. And it's about making choices and respecting their culture and beliefs. Person-centred care is about recognising that everybody is different and everybody has different needs. So not everybody likes doing the same things. So think about yourself for a moment. What's your favourite food? If I think about myself with that question, my favourite food... Hmm, I'd definitely say something chicken based. Um, depends on my mood though. I quite like a curry, quite like a Chinese. But then I also quite like eating healthier foods. Do you like to read? And if so, what genre is your favourite? So with me, I wouldn't say that I like to read, but then when I do read, I do quite enjoy it. It wouldn't be my first sort of way to amuse myself. Um, my favourite genre would be something like, I like quite factual books, so I like sort of memoir books. So recently I've read a book about um, a doctor who was based in prisons in the UK. That was quite interesting. Lots of true stories and bits in between there. It's good. What type of clothes do you feel most comfortable wearing? Well, I think the uh, pandemic lately has uh, changed the way that some of us may dress, so typically me. Um, I'm wearing leggings, a t-shirt and a jumper nowadays, whereas 
I would feel more comfortable in a classroom wearing something much smarter. So I think it depends on the situation that you're in. Just because somebody has dementia, it doesn't mean that they no longer have any of these needs, wishes, likes or dislikes. So is it fair to make everybody go to bed at 8 p.m. and then get up again at 7 a.m.? What time would you like to go to bed? What time would you like to get up? I think for me, I like to be in bed for about 9.30, 10 o'clock. I end up usually scrolling on my phone for far too long in bed, but I try and try and put that down by 11. What time do I like to get up? I think my natural body clock is about 9.30 in the morning. Um, obviously work doesn't allow for this, so I do have to set an alarm for that. Um, but if it was the weekend, definitely about half nine would be ideal for me. Is it fair to have everybody sit down and have a meal at 4.30 p.m. so the kitchen staff can leave at 6 p.m.? Would you be hungry for your final meal before bed at 4.30 p.m.? Would you like it later or earlier, perhaps? For me, I do eat my dinner quite, uh, quite early, really. We tend to eat with tea um, about sort of half five, six o'clock. So we do eat quite early, but if it was 4.30, I think I'd be hungry by about eight. So when we're thinking about person-centred care, we've always got to focus on the abilities of the person rather than what the person has lost through their dementia. Although the brain is diseased, we should still focus on what mattered or still matters to that person, such as their family, their culture, their ethnicity or their gender. For question one, you have to relate theories to your answer when you're writing about the person-centred approach. For some of you, using theories could be a new experience. Remember, don't panic about this. We are here to support you. If you're wondering what a theory is, a theory is an idea that is used to explain something. So it is used as an attempt to explain why and to create an understanding. We are going to look at three theories. The first one is by Carl Rogers, and he calls his theory growth promoting climate. The second theory is by Abraham Maslow, and his theory is called the hierarchy of needs. The third theory that we're going to look at is by Tom Kitwood, and his theory is called Kitwood's model of dementia. When you are answering question one, you need to explain how and why the person-centred approach works. And to do this, you need to use at least two of the theorists to explain your answer. So now we're going to look at these theories in more detail. So we're going to start by looking at Carl Rogers and the growth promoting climate. Rogers theory looks at self-directed change and this means that it puts the power in the person or the service user not in the professionals so because the change is self-directed the service user makes the changes themselves it's not the professionals making this change instead the professionals will follow the lead of the service user because the service user is the person with the power. By looking at Carl Rogers and his growth promoting climate, this theory allows the service users to feel that they are able to express themselves about their feelings, their beliefs and what they would like their lives to be like. And that obviously includes their care. So when we're thinking about their feelings, it could be that we're considering that they are feeling a bit more sad today. When we're thinking about their beliefs, perhaps they are remembering their religion today. When we're thinking about what they want their lives to be like, perhaps they would like an extra hour in bed that day. Perhaps they don't want a bath or shower that day. 
Rogers focuses on how we see ourselves. He says that we need to understand ourselves and we need to understand our wishes and those wishes will include our care. By understanding ourselves and thinking about how we see ourselves, this helps us to grow in self-confidence. And self-confidence means that we believe in ourselves. So how can this relate to care? So when you're working in care, you need to respect people's understanding of themselves and their wishes to give them person-centered care. This is what allows the person to be confident because they're able to make their own decisions, they are able to tell you what they like and what they dislike. As dementia progresses, it can be a bit more tricky to understand uh, perhaps what the person is trying to tell you, what they would like or dislike, or perhaps they are finding it difficult to communicate this. But this is where you are able to give choices because you're still understanding the wish of that person if they are able to look at the item of clothing they would like to wear rather than being able to say it then that is okay that is still person-centered care by respecting your understanding of what they are trying to tell you by looking at that item of clothes you are helping them with their confidence and helping them to believe in themselves The next theorist we're going to look at is Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. So you will see on the screen here that we have a multicolored triangle with some descriptions on. Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs focuses on a person's physiological needs, such as air, water, food, their safety needs, such as their health, their property, shelter, things like that. It focuses then on their love and belonging, like friendships and family. It then focuses on their self-esteem, so how they may feel when they are respected. And right at the top there, we have a phrase called self-actualization. So let's look a bit more at Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we're going to start again by looking at the multicolored triangle. How Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs works is you start at the bottom and you fulfill those needs first and then you work up so that you're able to feel the best that a person can. So you'll see that this diagram here has categorized it into basic needs, psychological needs and self-fulfillment needs. So firstly, let's start at the very bottom, the first part of your basic needs. So again, we can see it says physiological needs, food, water, warmth and rest. If we do not have food, if we do not have water, warmth or rest, then we cannot progress to the next stage of this chart. We need to be able to have all of those items fulfilled before we can move on to feeling safe. When we move up a level, so when, when our physiological needs are met, we can then think about our safety needs. Do we feel secure? Do we feel safe? If a person is in a care home with dementia, they should be given food, they should be given water, they should be feeling warmth through the heating system and through their clothes, and they should be getting rest because they'll be provided with a bed. So those needs should be met. The next one, safety needs, security and safety. Again, those basic needs should be met because there should be security. Perhaps the care home will have uh, keypad locks on the doors or magnet locks so that when they close they stay locked until they are opened again with a swipe card or with a key code. Mm. Safety. The people in care should be exactly that. They should be cared for. They should feel safe. So only when those basic needs are met can we then move up a level to feel a belongingness and love needs. So on here, it says intimate relationships. So many of the service users that you work with will be uh, married, perhaps widowed, divorced, but they will have been in some sort of relationship during their lives. 
We here we can also think about families and their friends as well. If people have those relationships, if they have a marriage, if they have a family network, if they have a friends network, then they can feel the next stage, which is esteem. They can fulfill these needs. So they can feel more confident. They can feel respect. So these are both the psychological category of needs. Only when they feel all of these sections can they feel the best of their potential right at the top there. If at any point any of these items get taken away, so for example, you could be caring for somebody who is unable to get sleep at night, but they've previously been feeling the self-actualization. If they're unable to get sleep at night, that basic need is taken away. They are right back down to stage one, right at the bottom. They need to then work their way back up. If you are working with somebody and they become a widow and they're aware that they've just become a widow, that sense of belonging and love needs is going to be taken away. So they're going to start again at safety needs because they need to build back up. So this is not just for people in care. It's not just for service users. Maslow created his hierarchy of needs for all humans. So you could think about where you are in your life now. So you couldn't have signed up for your course if you didn't have your physiological needs met, like food and water. You wouldn't have stayed on the course if you didn't feel safe. You're part of a group on Microsoft Teams, and although this isn't the same as a classroom setting, you must feel that you belong there. You're saying good morning each day. Hopefully you feel confident from doing the course and this will lead you to employment. And then when you get your first wage, you should feel that you've reached that potential. Obviously, this is just an example of what I was thinking about when I was writing this up. For some of you, it'll be different, but hopefully we'll get you all up to that point where you're getting that first wage packet and feeling that self-worth and joy and happiness. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So in person-centred care, we need to think about these when we relate it back to care. So the physiological needs, we need to fulfil their basic needs, like ensure when they have food to eat, water to drink, when warm clothes to wear, and a routine to allow them to rest. We need to ensure their safety needs by ensuring they're protected from abuse or neglect and ensure that they've got a secure place to live where they're safe. We need to fulfill their emotional needs by ensuring they have people to socialize with and people to call friends. So in a care home, people could spend time with one another in a communal area. Their self-esteem, we need to do this by giving them privacy, dignity and respect during all aspects of care, including personal care and dressing. We need to give them the opportunity of having a choice. If all of these steps are taken in physiological safety, love and belonging and esteem, then the service user should feel joy and happy and confident and fulfilled. So they should have that sense of self-worth. Tom Kitwood's model of dementia. So Kitwood explains dementia as an equation. Please don't worry about maths at this stage. I'll talk you through it. So the reason that he believes that it's an equation He believes that it's not just a disease of the brain that we need to focus on. So it's not just the dementia that we need to focus on. But instead, we need to think about the other factors that are affecting people's lives. So Tom Kitwood found that people have increased self-confidence and self-esteem. And if they do, their well-being could be improved. And this would result in something called rementia, which is where their symptoms of dementia could actually improve by increasing their self-confidence. So Kitwood explains dementia as an equation. So 
Again, please don't panic about maths at this stage. I'll talk you through it. So what he's saying is that D equals NI plus PH plus B plus N MSP. Now looking at that, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to even myself. So let's break this down. So what he's saying is that D, that dementia is the neurological impairment, the damage caused by the dementia, plus the physical health, the conditions and illnesses, plus the biography, the person's life history, plus the malignant social psychology, the negative ways that people with dementia are treated. So let's break that down even further. So Tom Kitwood says that dementia is the damage caused by dementia in the brain, plus any other conditions or illnesses the person has, plus their life history, plus the negative attitudes in which they are treated because of their dementia. So I've just written that out here for you in case you were wondering. So dementia is a combination of the damage caused within the brain, other conditions or illnesses the person has, what their life was like and what made them who they are today, and the way that they've been treated by their friends, carers, relatives and others in society. What Tom Kitwood is saying is that an individual's dementia will develop and the extent to which it affects them is not just down to the dementia itself and the changes to their brain. Instead, he says that we need to look at the person as a whole and we need to think about things like their general health and their well-being. We need to think about their previous life experiences and how people around them are treating them. So although dementia is a physical disease in the brain, we need to think about the other factors like their well-being, their life and their treatment by others. So let's just have a little summary here. So Carl Rogers and his growth promoting climate theory. What Carl Rogers was saying was that being able to express yourself and truly being yourself will raise your self-confidence. Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs theory. What Abraham Maslow was saying was that we cannot feel confident and fulfilled unless we have all of our needs met. Tom Kitwood's model of dementia. So what Tom Kitwood was saying is that it's important to take into account other factors as well as dementia to maintain the personhood to improve their well-being and self-confidence and even improve their dementia symptoms. Previously, we have looked at a case study about a lady called Caitlin. So because this case study is familiar to you, I would like to review this and see how the person-centered support theorists can help Caitlin further. So Caitlin is 88 and has Alzheimer's disease. She lives in a care home for people with dementia. Caitlin is in the middle stages of the disease and has symptoms including memory problems, forgetting where she is and being suspicious of others. Caitlin sometimes thinks that she's at the shop and gets her handbag from her room and tells staff that she's just nipping out. She often asks for paper and a pen to write a list of things that she needs. Caitlin puts things in her pockets that are not hers and gets upset when staff take them from her. She thinks the staff are stealing from her. Caitlin does not like to be told what to do, especially with personal care and dressing. She says that she can look after herself and that she doesn't need help and tells the staff that they are trying to control her by choosing her clothes and tells them that she isn't stupid. But Caitlin doesn't, Caitlin neglects her personal hygiene and needs to be reminded to wash. So previously we looked at the person-centred care and non-person-centred care. 
So with person-centred care, Caitlin's handbag is hung in her bedroom so she could find it easily. Without person-centred care, Caitlin's handbag will be kept in her wardrobe so that her room looks neat and tidy. With person-centred care, Caitlin's handbag contains a notepad and a pencil so she can make a shopping list. Without person-centred care, Caitlin can have paper but cannot have a pen or pencil in case she uses it as a weapon because they can be sharp. The staff will write it for her. With person-centred care, staff will ask Caitlin if they can have the item that's in her pocket rather than just take it from her. They will ask her again if she says no. Without person-centred care, Caitlin's pockets will be stitched up so she cannot place things in the pockets that do not belong to her. This will stop her stealing. With person-centred care, Caitlin will choose her clothes each day. She will be given a bowl of water to give a chance to get herself ready. She'll be provided with encouragement to empower her rather than being washed by staff. And without person-centred care, Caitlin needs full support with washing and dressing each day as she does not look after her own personal hygiene. If she complains, she must, staff must tell her that she needs it because she doesn't look after herself anymore. So let's think about her feelings here. So if she's given the person-centred care, she could feel confident. She could feel empowered, cared for and safe. And without person-centred care, she could feel that she's in danger. She could feel uncared for or not respected. She may feel worthless and she may even feel that the staff are against her. So let's now relate this to theory. So let's firstly look at Maslow. So with Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, we can see that with Caitlin, her basic needs are being met. So she's got food, water and air. With non-person centred care, it's the same thing. Her food, water and air are being met. With safety needs in person centred care, she has shelter and safety. She should feel safe. Safety needs in non-person centred care, shelter's met, but she might feel unsafe. So that's a bit of a maybe at the moment. Psychological needs, so a sense of belonging and confidence. In person-centred care, these are met. Her psychological needs in non-person-centred care, however, she won't feel a sense of belonging because she'll feel the staff are against her and she won't feel any sort of respect. So they're not met. So that's where we're going to have to stop there. However, in the person-centred care, we should be able to go to self-fulfilment, which is completing the triangle. If we now look at Carl Rogers and his growth promoting climate, Carl Rogers focuses on feelings, beliefs and what people would like their lives to be like. So with person-centred care and Caitlin's feelings, staff are trying to keep Caitlin positive by allowing her to have control of her care, such as finding her own handbag and writing her own shopping list. Whereas in non-person-centred care, with regards to Caitlin's feelings, the staff are taking over her care and they're not respecting her feelings. Her handbag is hidden and the list is written for her. In person-centred care, Caitlin's beliefs, she's being allowed to express herself. Whereas in non-person-centred care, the staff are really only letting Caitlin to express negative behaviours because those negative behaviours are actually being caused by those staff's actions. What they want their lives to be like, including their care. So in person-centred care, the staff are allowing Caitlin to have a voice regarding her personal care and dressing, but with encouragement. But in the non-person-centred care, the staff are not allowing Caitlin to have a voice because they've taken over her care and her choices. If we look at Kitwood's model, we're going to focus this time on neurological, illnesses, biography and attitudes. So if we think about Kitwood's model, neurologically, first of all, in person-centred care, 
The staff are acknowledging that she has dementia and know what her main symptoms are, including memory loss. Whereas in non-person-centred care, it's almost like the staff are blaming her dementia on the way that she's behaving. If we think about other illnesses and conditions, we don't know that Caitlin has any other illnesses or conditions at this moment. So in person-centred care, we're not taking into account any of those. Whereas in non-person-centred care, it's more or less the same, but they're viewing her dementia as her main condition. Her biography. So in person-centred care, staff are understanding that Caitlin regularly went out shopping and it's something that she enjoyed so they're respecting her choice to continue to do that whereas in non-person centred care there's no consideration with regards to who she was in her life history they're not caring that shopping was something that she enjoyed the attitude and the way that she's treated so again in person centred care the staff know that if they treat her with respect they in turn will be respected as well Whereas in non-person centred care, the staff think that they know best on how to treat Caitlin and they say that the way they work is to ensure that she and others around her are safe. But by doing that, they're completely disrespecting her. So you're now ready to answer question one. Describe what is meant by the person centred approach when working in health and social care, particularly with those with dementia. At level two, to describe, you need to be writing about three paragraphs of about three sentences each. And remember, to answer this question, you need to show your understanding of the person-centred approach by describing some of the values that underpin the person-centred care. And then to show your level two knowledge, you need to write about two of the theorists that are featured in your learning material. So we just looked at Carl Rogers and his growth promoting climate. Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, and Tom Kitwood's model of dementia. You can use all three if you wish to, but you're only required to use two. Please pause this video whilst you answer this question. So the person-centred approach has many benefits, and it's not only to the service user. The person-centred approach has benefits for their family, their informal carers, such as their family, their friends, the neighbours, and other professionals working with the service user. So with regards to their family, the person-centred approach has benefits because they can, they can see that it benefits their loved ones. So they're going to appreciate that people have taken the time to learn about their loved one and learn about what they like and dislike and what their wishes are and that they're not just being treated like patient A or patient B. Informal carers, because they work with the service user, they know that person best. Other professionals working with the service user. So because the other professionals working with the service user know the service user best. Um, they can recommend treatments that are unique to that individual's needs. So it could be that they are working with somebody who recently had a fall and they hurt their leg, but they, they haven't broken any bones or anything. And perhaps they just want to, you know, get them walking again, again, get them a bit more sort of well balanced and a bit more confident, really, to get themselves moving. But if they don't take into account the person broke their ankle 20 years ago and it still gives them a bit of grief every now and again, then they're not going to perhaps use the best method. So remember that when you are working with a service user with dementia, it is really important that you treat that individual as a person. You need to make sure their wants, their needs and their wishes are listened to. You don't want to view them as a collection of symptoms that need to be managed because they are a person. They are not just dementia. People with dementia are just people who sometimes get on with the world a different way than they did before. And that's the important key message here. 
Some studies show that if people with dementia have been given the right care and the right support, they can experience clear thinking, which we looked at this term before, rementia. We looked at that in Tom Kitwood's model previously. This means that person-centred care can allow people with dementia to function more if they were given person than if they were not given person-centred care. But the level of support has to be individual for them. Person-centred care can also have benefits on such improving people's sleep patterns. It can reduce agitation or stress. It can, re it can improve people's self-esteem and their confidence, and it can improve their general quality of life. So person-centred care is a key importance to the person with dementia, because if it can improve their sleep, if it can stop them being stressed, if it can make them feel more confident in their own decisions and ultimately have clear thinking and improve their quality of life, then it's a winner in my books. Let's have a look at these in more detail. So improving sleep patterns. Evidence shows that if service users enjoy activities based on their previous interests, but thinking about their capabilities at the moment, then their sleep improves because daytime naps are reduced. So if they're not sleeping as much in the day because they're enjoying their activities, then they will sleep better at night. Reducing agitation. If people with dementia in the early stages continue with activities that they previously enjoyed, studies found that service users were generally happier, so less stressed, less anxious. Self-esteem and confidence. If service users can plan their own support, research shows that they feel more confident as the care plan focuses on what they can do. Improves quality of life. So if people with dementia are given choices and can manage own aspects of their life, such as what to wear, what to do or what to eat, then verbal agitation can be reduced. Now, the same goes hand in hand with the staff because as a staff member, you will feel more positive when you're giving service users choices because it's gonna be less demanding for you and there'll be less running around for you. So it should really go hand in hand with the staff general quality of life and mood and the service users general quality of life and mood. So we're going to take a look at a case study of Mary. So Mary has Alzheimer's disease and is living in a residential care home. She used to take a considerable amount of medication and spend much of the day sleeping in a chair in the lounge. In between sleeping, she would walk around shouting for George and asking someone to take her home. The pattern at night was similar with episodes of wandering and shouting. Because of the disturbance to others, Mary was prescribed medication to improve her sleeping. But the whole approach in the residential home changed following the appointment of a new officer in charge. Staff were now trained in person-centred working and residents' medications were reviewed. Staff spent time with Mary and her family to talk about her life. They discovered that Mary used to work for a multinational company as a personal secretary to a senior manager, and she was a keen gardener in her spare time. Mary was able to contribute some of what she wanted. A plan was worked where she could spend more time in the garden whenever she wanted, and she would look after plants in her own room. It was also agreed the staff would keep an eye on those plants just in case Mary forgot about them on some days. Mary's organising skills were put to use. She offered as much help as she could to file the information that was being gathered for a project about the history of the local community and this was being planned with pupils from a local school. When Mary stopped taking so much medication she was much more alert in the daytime. Her activity in the garden and working on the local community project made her quite tired, so she began to sleep better. She was far less agitated because someone would always respond to her as she began to worry about wanting to go home. So what difference did the person-centred approach make to Mary? What do you 
think may have been the future for Mary without a change in approach. So I would say that Mary had felt happier, that she had higher levels of confidence, that she felt valued, listened to, and she found a purpose in life which gave her fulfilment and, and joy. Without the person-centred approach change, she would have stayed on the medication to help her sleep, which probably would have just made her more drowsy. The carers would be telling Mary to sit down when she was wandering and would remain agitated about not going home. She would have ended up spending more time in a chair, sleeping. She wouldn't have felt happy. She wouldn't have that high level of self-confidence. She wouldn't have felt valued or listened to, and she definitely wouldn't have had a purpose in her life. So she wouldn't have felt fulfillment or joy. You can also see from this case study with Mary that the element of what the staff are being included in part of sort of managing her behaviours is that they are now going to help her to water her plants and to maybe help her to gather some information on a community project whereas without the person-centered care they are very much medicating her telling her off encouraging her to sit down encouraging her to sleep it's just not nice Now I would like you to outline what the benefits of person-centred support are to an individual and show how this will make the individual feel valued and able to engage in daily life. So you need to identify the benefits of person-centred support and then explain how this can affect a person's mood towards their care and how this approach could help them to live a better life each day. Please pause this video to answer this question. As the population ages, the need for carers is greater than ever before. We also empower people to live within the community in their own homes where possible for as long as they can. Research estimates that there'll be 9.5 million people employed as carers by 2037 Though not all will be supporting people with dementia, a large number will be. Carers are a vital support for people with dementia. Many people who are diagnosed with dementia begin with informal carers like their family or their neighbours. But this role is not easy and it's very demanding and very stressful. The informal carers work in partnership with professional staff like nurses and GPs. The informal carer's role will be ever changing because the needs of the person they're caring for will be changing too. A key element to person-centred care is the role provided by their family and by their friends. Family and friend carers are great at communicating with the service user because they know them best. That family member can be there to provide a sense of calm, reassurance and to help them in times of distress and it's more valuable than having a professional member of staff that they're very unfamiliar with trying to do this. The informal carers know the service user and they know their wishes, their needs and their preferences. They know what they like and dislike and this aids person-centred care. When people are working as informal carers, they are working with a person with dementia who they are familiar with. So this could be in their own home, this could be in the home of the informal carer, and they are generally supported by professional staff. So the informal carer should feel in control, able to care for their loved one, and can provide support to that person. But remember, there are completely different levels of care and support at this stage. It could be that an informal carer, like a daughter, is popping in to ensure their parent is okay. Or it could be a full time support role with the support of professional staff. So it could be 24 hour care, seven days a week. When a person with dementia is in residential care, it can become very difficult for informal carers to find the balance working with professional staff and seeing that they still have a role. 
the informal carer might feel some mixed emotions. They might feel guilty that they're no longer to provide the care that they were doing before. But sometimes people may feel relieved because they no longer have that level of responsibility and worry and stress. Sometimes it's the mixed emotions that mean the informal carers can find it difficult to find a caring role to support their loved one. Sometimes informal carers may disappear and feel that they have no role to play now that their loved one is living in residential care. But it is so important to remember that informal carers will still know that service user best and have the best knowledge and understanding of that service user. So although the service user has now moved into a residential care setting, such as a care home, it doesn't mean that the informal carers no longer have a role. Some may want more resp responsibility here though than others. If we think for a moment about younger individuals, so if somebody was to get dementia below the age of 65, they are considered to have early onset dementia. So let's think about that for a moment. So if somebody has dementia, they're 35 years old, they're married, they have two children who are 10 and eight years old, what role could the informal carers play here? So the informal carer could support the service user to remember their children, to still be young despite requiring care because we don't want them to sort of fall into their, um, you know, the activities that aren't age related. We want them to enjoy activities that are related to their age range abilities and things that they previously enjoyed. But we also need to factor in the fact that the husband is probably still having to work, still pick up the children from school, having to cook and clean. So their role will be very stressful. Let's now think about older individuals. So if somebody gets dementia over the age of 65, they are classed as an older individual with dementia. So if somebody has dementia and they are 95 years old, they're married but widowed, they have two children in their early to mid 70s who are enjoying their retirement, but have some health needs of their own, what role could, those, could their children play as an informal carer? So they could still support the person with dementia, they could still support their mother, but without doing the physical tasks because of their own health needs, um, they're going to probably avoid that personal care and dressing. But they can share what their mother liked to do and wear and eat and drink and they can really paint a picture of who she was. They can engage her in activities that she previously enjoyed or they could take her out for the day with somewhere where she previously loved to go perhaps. Individuals with learning disabilities. So if somebody gets dementia and they have a learning disability, it can sometimes be quite hard to tell what is dementia and what is the learning disability. So people with Down syndrome tend to get Alzheimer's disease in their sort of 40s or 50s, and they may have lived with their parents until this age, or they may have lived in residential care already. As the learning disability and dementia could have similar symptoms, the informal carers can help to distinguish or show you what their normal behaviours are from their learning difficulties. So it could be that you as a staff member are asking the person with a learning difficulty to try and do something like, say, counting money, and maybe they've never been able to count money before. The informal carers can help to educate you as the staff member on who the person is and what they can and can't do as part of that learning disability. Individuals from different ethnic backgrounds. So if somebody gets dementia and they are from a different ethnic background, we need to make sure that we use the informal carers again to paint a picture of who they are, but also to think about how their culture will change the way they like to be treated, because this needs to be person centred too. So in some countries, for example, nodding your head means no and shaking your head means yes, which obviously in the UK is the opposite meaning. Some people could have a language barrier. Some people might not be able to be cared for by a person of the opposite sex. And it's the informal carers again that can educate the staff of these differences to ensure that that care is person centered. So for your next question, I would like you to describe the role that carers can have when supporting individuals with dementia. 
and I'd like you to include some of those examples. Uh, think of your own as well, please. Younger individuals, older individuals, those with learning difficulties and people from different ethnic backgrounds. Please pause this video whilst you answer that question. Involving informal carers. So involving informal carers in the care and support of a person with dementia is the best way for them to understand person-centred working. The informal carer can do as much or as little as they want for their friend or relative. Just because they are now in residential care, it doesn't mean that the carers no longer have a purpose. The informal carers may wish to undertake personal care and dressing or, or similar tasks for the service user. They might like to take them out to a social activity or engage them in creative activities. But remember, not every informal carer will want the same involvement and they are unique and this needs to be viewed as person centred as well. Informal carers can tell you lots about the service user, about their likes, their preferences, their dislikes and their routines. They can tell you about their history, what were they like, where did they work, did they have children, do they have grandchildren, are they an aunt or an uncle? Getting the good working relationship with the informal carers is going to enable you to paint a picture of the person that you're caring for to add value to the care that you provide to that service user. So we're just going to have a look at a case study of uh, a lady called Yolanda. So Yolanda has dementia. She is 75 years old and was cared for by her daughter, Cherise, until her memory lapses meant that she was placing herself and her daughter's children at risk by leaving the heaters on, leaving the cookers on and leaving the front door open at night. Following Yolanda's admission to residential care, her daughter has been as keen as possible to be involved in her mother's support package. In the planning meeting, it was agreed with Yolanda that her daughter will come and share lunch with her most days and then stay with her for a couple of hours each afternoon. Yolanda is interested in music. She used to sing in the local choir and she played the piano. Cherise takes her to a local music group one afternoon a week at the local church. The group is for people with dementia. There, they can play instruments, they can listen to music and they can sing and dance. Yolanda will continue to go to the music group every week with Cherise. What are the benefits of Cherise being actively involved in the support plan for her mother? So what are the benefits for Yolanda? What are the benefits for Cherise? And what are the benefits for the professional staff in the care home? Professional relationships with informal carers. So when you're working with the service user's family, their partner, their neighbours or their friends, you must maintain that professional relationship. Many people living with dementia in the UK live at home. So many people rely on informal carers, such as their partners, their friends, their family, their neighbours. You must create and maintain appropriate relationships based on respect. This is key for individuals and their families. Your role as a professional carer is to create an environment in which people feel their needs are being heard and understood. And this requires integrity, honesty and skill. Some successful some essential qualities of successful relationships are things like trust and respect, empathy and warmth, sensitivity and touching when appropriate. But you must always remember the cultural and religious differences that people may have and respect those. Professional boundaries are a crucial part of the carer's relationship with the service user and with their informal carers. Some examples of crossing this boundary are 
having a romantic or sexual relationship with the service user, with their family, their friends, their neighbours or their partner. It is not appropriate to have a romantic or sexual relationship with any of those people. Telling the service user or caregivers your life story. So if you go into the service user's house as part of your home caring role, you are not there to tell the service user or their caregivers all about your life. Yes, you may have had a hard time last week. Maybe you had to go to court for, you know, a driving offence or something. It is nothing to do with the, with the service users or their caregivers or their informal carers. The care is about the service user. It is not about you. Receiving money, receiving a gift of money from their service user or their caregivers. So from their informal carers. So you should not be given any sort of cash, money or any gifts from any service users, their family, their friends, etc. Um, this can be seen as bribery. When you start working for a professional care agency, you will see it as part of your contract that there will be a gift policy in there. Now, these will differ from workplace to workplace. Some workplaces let you accept a gift of no more than five pounds, for example. Some places don't ask you to declare things like flowers or chocolates. Um, but I think it's down to you as a professional to decide that actually, you know, receiving one bunch of flowers on your birthday is one thing and not not declaring that. But if you were receiving flowers and chocolates every time you visited a certain person's house from their partner, for example, then it could be seen as like a sexual advance on yourself or a bribe. So do make sure that you look at the gift policy at your workplace. So informal carers can get extra benefits and support. So sometimes they might feel that they're coping OK. Uh, some people might feel they need some extra support physically and mentally. Like we said, being an informal carer can be a very tricky job to do because you're not you're not working for anybody but sort of yourselves, really. So having this professional working relationship with the informal carers will enable them to open up about the help and support they may need. So they may tell you, I'm really struggling with this. I can't cope when she says this to me. This is a benefit because it supports the informal carer to correctly care for the service user and it ensures best practice and safety as well. So some examples of benefits and support so it could be that the informal carer needs to take a break so a home care agency could arrange for breaks whether that be planned fixed flexible breaks maybe the informal carer needs aids and equipment and adaptation so the physical environment can be assessed by an occupational therapist and it can be adapted to make caring easier so they could put a ramp outside to help get a wheelchair in or Perhaps it's just that the person struggles with steps. They could put a hoist in if they're no longer to bear weight. Informal carers need support to undertake training. So they'll need cover for their role whilst they're undertaking training. So they'll need, again, somebody to come in from a professional care agency. Informal carers need time and in interest for themselves. So they need to have some time of their own. So again, they need that break. For your final question today, I would like you to explain the value of developing a professional working relationship with carers. So carers in this question, remember, relates to informal carers like their family, neighbours, friends, partners, not paid carers. So you're answering this from the perspective of a professional carer who is working with somebody with dementia alongside informal carers. So why is it important that you develop that professional, working, strong relationship with the informal carers? At level two, I would like you to ensure that you are explaining using three paragraphs with around three to four sentences each. A review of your aims and objectives were to know what is meant by person-centered care, to understand the benefits of person-centered care, and to understand the roles in the care and support of individuals with dementia.